Uh, Adrian Crenshaw is a, is a well-known speaker in the information security world. He runs uh, his website, ironhoop.com. He has a number of videos, how-to videos. Uh, he presently works as a pen tester at a big Fortune 500 company. Was a thousand. I'm not sure. Fortune 1000. I'm not sure what his stock is right now. <laughs> so, take it away, Adrian. Thank you much. Well, we're out of shopping around ideas for my talk, but Aid uh, had a couple of different ones. But Bill also wanted an anti forensics talk since one of the major tracks here is forensics. So, this is that talk. It's only been slightly updated from a longer class version I've done, uh, which is just like if you want to see a three hour version of this with more hands on demos, it's out there. And the URL I believe I'll have in the slides. Also, if anybody wants a slide, just give me a yell. Now, this will be, oh, a little bit about me. I went to iongeek.com. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know anything, I'm just a geek with time in my hands. I'm also an irregular on the ISD podcast. We podcast five times a week, sometimes six times a week. And also a co-founder of DerbyCon. And I work for a Fortune 1000 company as a senior security engineer, which I need to put that back in the slides. All right, short version of what this talk's gonna be about uh, is essentially, uh, we're gonna talk about anti-forensics and how to hide your tracks. I have a much longer version of this talk out there, and that's at that URL, though, like I said, that URL is not very uh, user-friendly, so if you do a search for anti-forensics and Iron Geek, you'll more than likely find that page. Uh, but I also want to leave early, the core of this is, if you want to practice good anti-forensics, maintain physical control of your box, uh, use full hard drive encryption, and keep things separate. Don't use this particular machine for something else that's public when you want to keep other things private. And we'll go a little bit separation in a bit. Now you might wonder why I'm calling this occult computing. Well, occult essentially is Latin for uh, knowledge of hidden. Um, and sometimes when you're trying to hide stuff on a computer, you're not necessarily hiding it from law. My understanding, forensics directly involves, you know, or usually applies to law. And you may be trying to hide something from some other type of entity. So that plays into it. EA, EA, Cthulhu for Target, for those people who are HP Lovecraft fans. All right, so what's this talk about? We're not going to be just talking about st uh, hiding your stash in the fuzz, or um, law enforcement may find this talk useful uh, for just knowing what people might do. They see certain tools on the, a box, they'll have an idea what the person's been up to. Users may want to know how to hide their activities from invasive law or policy enforcement. Uh, I've unfortunately been in some organizations where policy isn't really policy, it's basically a blunt weapon to use against people they dislike. Uh, companies may also want to know how to clear boxes before donating to someplace else. I'll be talking a little bit about that as well. And uh, most of this talk is going to be based on Windows, but a lot of the ideas are applicable for other operating systems. A quick search for the OS name and the concept will probably give you similar tools in other platforms. And uh, I'm not going to go cover malware analysis nor network anti-forensics, at least not much. I may briefly mention tools like Tor and I2P, which you can use to hide your presence on the internet. But the focus of this is, if someone has access to your box physically, what they can find out and how to keep people from finding things out. And uh, most of we're going to cover hiding tracks left behind on storage media. Okay, there's four general categories of anti-forensics techniques that I put things in, and one is don't leave tracks in the first place. No one is select the file removing and encryption tools. By the way, just not freaking practical, but we'll go into that in a second. Parlor tricks, things that people recommend for anti forensics and hiding stuff that is kind of neat, kind of interesting, but doesn't necessarily really work. And nuke it from orbit, it's the only way to be sure. All right, Iron Geek's first two rules of personal privacy. If it's not easy, folks won't do it. If it takes a lot of time to do something, people aren't going to bother. I mean, full hard drive encryption actually now is fairly simple, but if I asked you to uh, automatically always uh, use like the Cypher tool to wipe out all empty space in your hard drive every day, you might automate it, but most people aren't going to do those kind of things. There are certain practices that are just a pain to do. Also, if it's not secure, there's no point in doing it. Some techniques people recommend like selective file wiping just isn't useful enough to where you should bother doing it versus some other technique. And we're going to be talking about some of those. And I kind of made this a Venn diagram from hell to show how things are interrelated. We're trying to look at this sweet spot of comprehensive, secure, convenient, and some technical solutions. 
Uh, we're trying to avoid the weak stuff. For instance, uh, just deleting a file would probably go into category one. Because you just delete a file, how many people here know what file carving is? All right, for those that don't know, my, my forensics guys on this side apparently, file carving is when, let's say the file's deleted, so it's out of the allocation table, in theory. Uh, you can scroll down the, the, well, certain file types have known headers and footers, so you can go down the drive, byte for byte, looking for those headers and footers, then just pluck that right off the drive. Because when you delete something, all you're really doing is marking it as unallocated, but it can still be on that drive. Also, there's various things like um, uh, defragging and uh, volume shadow copy to make that more difficult. Uh, selective file wiping is also painful. It's better than before the other stuff, but um, because of defragging and volume shadow copy, just because you delete a file from one place doesn't mean it's not really someplace else. We'll cover that a bit here. Uh, full drive wiping and encryption, that I'd say is comprehensive. It's not necessarily convenient. It's secure and technical and comprehensive, but not really convenient. Because once you wipe a drive, you have to go ahead and reinstall everything and set everything up again, and that could be a pain. And uh, four would be hidden partitions. There's ways of hiding stuff on a drive that if someone knows what they're looking for, they can get to it, but the average person can't. Generally, these are going to be, I have it just, just technical and weak, but they can also be kind of convenient. And then those things like Stego, which are uh, interesting concepts. I don't see a whole lot of people using them. Stego is a steganography. Anybody familiar with steganography? Steganography is basically the uh, practice of how to hide data in other data so people can't find it. So you see a certain file, oh, this is just a zip file. No, really, it's an image file depending on how you look at it. All right, background info. Stuff that's useful to know. I'm going to gloss over this because I only have so much time for this talk, but uh, some of you may have heard of these cases already. Julia Romero, this was a lady uh, a while back. She was working in, uh, I don't know, this grade school, and she all of a sudden had a, what's known as a porn star. Does anybody remember back in the late 90s hitting a website and all of a sudden six billion pop-ups come up with pornography? Oh, yeah. Well, she had the same thing happen to her while in a classroom teaching in front of kids. She got some charges put against her, like uh, corruption of minors or something like that, or child endangerment. And it really wasn't her fault when you actually looked into the details. Uh, she didn't know to shut that machine down. She thought she might damage the machine or whatnot if she just shut the machine down. And this was a Windows 98 box in the early 2000s, which was massively under, not patched. Uh, and for some reason, the prosecutor just came coming after her. So she's an interesting case to look up uh, as far as uh, forensics and botched forensics. Uh, Sebastian Boxer, Boxer, I believe, is also a good one to look up. This guy uh, came across the Canadian border. They found what they believe to be a child pornography on his hard drive. Then they shut the machine down. When they tried to bring it back up again, he had full hard drive encryption. And then there was a whole legal debate about whether or not someone had to reveal their password or not, if asked, whether or not a password is a product of the mind, or if it's more akin to a key. Because my understanding legally, you can subpoena, subpoena a key, but you can't force them to incriminate themselves. But is your password more akin to a key or incriminating yourself? And there was also the legal wrangling about this that I don't remember all the details of. Also, a subject matter that's interesting to look up is hacker defense. This is where someone claims that, uh, Oh, I wasn't me that did this on the machine. Some hacker must have put the files there. And now, in the case of Julia Merrow, that was a completely reasonable defense, and that is what happened to her. Though hacker wouldn't be the right term. She got some malware on that machine, and she had a porn storm pop up. Uh, other people, however, like uh, Glenn, the guy who just won this last contest, if he pulled up the hacker defense, yeah, someone else compromised my machine and did that. It may not work for him so well. Just saying. But please don't arrest him, because, you know, I need him to pay rent. Um, <laughs> Oh, also, there's really these legal questions like data retention and when is it okay to wipe your drive and if you have a policy that says you can wipe it at certain times and not other times, these are all legal questions you probably want to talk to a lawyer, though getting a lawyer will give you a straight answer. How many lawyers are in the room? <laughs> no one's even willing to admit it. Huh. Uh, getting a straight answer from a lawyer is going to be a problem. Also, uh, the topic of any forensics, sometimes I'm going to show you would be destroying the data. I'm not recommending doing this. I'm just saying this is what people can do to hide information. But there's something called correlation of a uh, data, which quite frankly is you can get like a negative inference against you where a judge says, well, it appears that you deleted the data, so we're going to automatically assume and tell the jury to assume it was there. Am I getting that right more or less technically from a legal standpoint? So sometimes actually the spoilation might be worse than the data they can actually find on your drive. And then there's the CSI effect, where apparently juries have been running more and more technical uh, content or think they know more and more about actual forensics than they do and they're expecting higher levels of proof than they can actually get in a modern court. 
maybe along the lines of, well, we got this picture, but it's also off the floor. Can't we just enhance it? Enhance it? Enhance it? Enhance it? All of a sudden, you see microscopic details. I'm not sure where the hell they get that from. Also, there was some work in uh, plausible deniability toolkit. This kind of plays into the hacker defense, but a couple of people from uh, Simple Nomad Mobile Research Center gave a presentation at DEF CON on that subject. Those are all worth looking at. Like I said, these slides, I have an old version of these slides already up, and I'll probably post them along with the aid videos when I get back home. I end up putting a lot of links for the research in my uh, talks, generally speaking. All right. Tech stuff. It's hard to cover all this stuff in order. Some of these things are interrelated concepts. And uh, you need to understand some things before you understand other things. Uh, but what you have to understand first is kind of questionable. Uh, Windows jams data in a lot of places, and uh, there are a lot of tools that make this data fairly easy to recover. So trying to do good anti-forensics on a Windows system can be difficult, because there's so many places data can get jammed. We're going to talk a little bit of a uh, technical background. When you look at a disk, now this is probably a little bit outdated and might be more conceptual than reality, especially when you start talking about things, or well, definitely when you start talking about things like solid state drives. You're going to have things like your track, which you see is this ring going around the drive. You have your, didn't mean to go forward, your geometric sector, your track sector, and a cluster. And basically, your um, file system is going to know where to put things on the disk by keeping track of this in more or less a table and organizing in this fashion. I'm going to talk a little bit about slack space. Now here's what slack space. I'm actually opening up in a hex editor to see the raw uh, bytes on a drive. And you see here I had a file I created called file2. Well, there's something called RAM slack, which it's called RAM slack because apparently at one time this was written from RAM. Let's say a file is only so many bytes long. Well, you're allocating a certain sector size. And you're not going to be able to allocate just the number of bytes you need. So there's some residual leftover data that goes right here. Apparently in some older operating systems that actually got um, thrown in from RAM, anymore it's blanked out. However, there's also residual slack. I showed you how the drive was, um, well, cylindrical in nature. Well, even if it's not, even if it's like solid state, you still have some of this going on where a certain number of seconds has been allocated to something, but then it's been deallocated and something else has been allocated to go there. In this case, you'll notice I put a file to at a certain location. That's what I actually called the file, but I also filled it with the, t with the uh, bytes file to over and over and over again. Then I put that file on top of something that was already there. Before I had a file called file one, which I tried to overwrite. File one was bigger than file two, so even though I overwrote file one with file two, since I didn't, it was a smaller file size, which trying to uh, be on the same sectors, you can still see a little bit of file one left behind. That's one of the things I was talking about, you get partial files back, um, and uh, we'll go more into why selective file wiping doesn't necessarily work. But that's an example of residual slack and RAM slack. So this can be leftovers from deleted files, even if part of it's been overwritten. Also, just to get the technical stuff out of the way, there's something called a hash. Essentially, hash is a way of making a fixed sized um, string out of some other string. And in theory, if a string is a, if a, if a hashing algorithm is a good hashing algorithm, it's going to be hard to make collisions. Basically, it's going to be hard to find two strings that are going to come down to the same hash. And also from that, and if you're talking about passwords, it's going to be hard to take that hash back to the original string. Now, MD5 has a lot of collision problems, but still a lot of people use it. Uh, in forensics, hashes are used a lot, so let's say you might hash out all the files on a drive, and then instead of looking byte for byte for each thing on the drive, you might compare the hashes to a bunch of known hashes for certain things that you want to find. Uh, child porn being a common example. Let's see. We also sometimes hear these referred to as uh, fingerprints. Uh, in the industry now, is, is SHA-1 pretty much the standard for most people doing forensics work, or are you all doing SHA-256? SHA-1 standard. SHA-1 still most, okay. MD5 you hear a lot of people use, and probably for things like um, file integrity checks, like you're downloading an ISO off the net, internet and you want to make sure it's still the same file, it's probably good enough for that. For passwords, not so good anymore, and I'm not so sure it's considered good for forensics anymore either, because it's a possibility of um, creating a collision. All right, drives also have these things called host protected areas and a disk configuration overlay where you can basically store something on the drive to where the operating system and BIOS can't see it. Now I put though this in the general um, 
interesting ideas, but not that useful for any forensics, because if someone knows to look at it, a good forensic examiner is going to find these anyway. And there's tools out there for looking for these hidden partitions. These are sometimes used for like putting uh, OS restores on, so that you can't easily hose it, but you can still get to it if you need to restore a system. Uh, also, there's various forensically interesting places in the Windows file system where data is stored. Uh, I have a whole list out there on my website, but Nearsoft makes some interesting tools for grabbing these things, like passwords or lists of the USB devices someone's plugged in. Uh, and uh, also, Def Linux was, uh, oh, I'm sure I know it's still active, it's like a Linux distribution meant for forensics that's uh, interesting to look at. Oh, back to the um, Nearsoft and the, uh, one of his tools, besides the password recovery tools, one of them shows you the list of like USB devices that have been attached before. Let's say you want to trace someone down on a network and find out where all they've plugged in a certain thumb drive. Most USB devices have a vendor ID, a product ID, and in some cases a serial, in the case of like thumb drives. Well, that gets recorded in, or in Windows case, the registry. So if you find a certain machine that had this particular thumb drive inserted into it, you may very well be able to find other machines in your network remotely via scripting that had that same thumb drive plugged in. Okay. Don't leave tracks behind in the first place. This is the first category. Now I've, I've got out most of the really uh, technical details. Uh, also, this is known as um, porn mode in various browsers. The idea is essentially not to leave the tracks in the first place. Not to remove them, but just not to leave them there. Uh, various operating systems, uh, sorry, various <coughs> web browsers have built-in privacy modes, or sometimes referred to as porn modes. Firefox calls it private browsing. Essentially, you can hit Control Shift P. Uh, IE is Control Shift P again. Chrome is Control Shift N, and you can also apparently set it up via the command line. They may have added this option to other browsers since I wrote this slide. And Opera got uh, the same thing, so I'm not sure if Opera has a solution for this. Is anybody an Opera user? I'm assuming that they've probably implemented some kind of privacy mode by now. But when you switch into uh, privacy mode, essentially nothing is stored as far as what your history is, what your passwords are you used are. And all that inferior is in memory and gets wiped out later on. Whether or not it really gets wiped out, I have some question about because just because it's in memory doesn't mean it doesn't wind up in the drive in some way. There's something called, um, well, swap space in uh, Unix like file systems and your, um, your swap file in Windows, where if you, don't have the hard drive, if you don't have enough memory, stuff gets swapped out to the hard drive. So just because the password is only in memory because of being in privacy by private browsing mode doesn't mean it didn't necessarily somehow wind up in that swap file. But I haven't done enough testing to actually say how secure the private browsing modes on these particular browsers are. Also, um, as far as keeping things separate, uh, I'm surprised that more people who don't try to keep the habits different as far as um, using a certain web browser for certain functions that they don't want to, uh, people to know about. For instance, installing portable apps, Firefox, and using it to always run in private mode via a shortcut or whatnot. And then for the general day-to-day -day activities that they don't care about people knowing about, keeping a normal Firefox installed as well. Uh, also, the nice thing with these is they can be stored on a thumb drive, ran from the thumb drive. In theory, if you do to save your data, you save it to the thumb drive, and then the thumb drive can be destroyed later on. And there's various tools out there for making portable browsers. Well, Portable Apps, of course, has various internet applications. But there's also the Tor Browser Bundle and Operator. Uh, who can, anybody familiar with Tor? Tor is basically a privacy network where you can ha have multiple hops, and you talk to the first node, everything's encrypted between you and them, and there's this never session encrypted between them and someone else, and them and someone else. And each one has a layer to where the first person you communicate with doesn't know who your in person is you're gonna talk to, he just knows the keys to encrypt his part and send it on to the next proxy. So the idea being is you have like forward secrecy where if someone doesn't necessarily know, the person you're directly communicating with doesn't know where you're talking to, and the person at the endpoint doesn't know who originally sent in the communications. Well, the Tor browser bundle has Tor built in for privacy, as well as, once again, bringing a, a mobile browser bundle for keeping all your factoids in one place. Also, they've done some various things to the uh, Tor browser bundle to increase the uh, security of it as far as what it stores on the machine. So its built version of private browsing is probably better than uh, the general versions of uh, the browser. Though keep in mind, Tor does not mean secure. Some people say, well, I'm going to use Tor so no one can see my data. Once it exits the exit point, that final proxy, someone can see it. There are people who use Tor 
but then they use uh, plain text passwords on various services like Top3 and whatnot to try to get out on the internet. That's the boot. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone's sniffing that connection and you know, they see an Iron Geek at some Top3 site, I'm no longer anonymous because it's whoever's logging into that machine with the name Iron Geek is probably me. Uh, there's actually some cases where people have done this. Probably not so much to hide as to get out of a country. There's been, uh, there was a guy who a while back who um, he set up his own tour exit point, and a bunch of different embassies were using tour to get out of the country that they were the, the host country they were in, and they up the host country to see what they were doing. But this guy set up his own tour uh, exit point and sat there and just collected passwords from various embassies around the world. All right, if you want to know more information about tour. Check out my Darknet's talk. I think I did a version of that here. Is uh, it last year that I did that one? And uh, also, uh, I2P is an interesting project, similar to Tor, but it's meant more for hiding stuff inside the network. Tor has something called hidden services where you can host a website inside Tor and no one knows who's hosting it. I2P has something like that as well, but it's, uh, in my opinion, it's a little bit faster. And that's more of I2P's focus. So you can host something without other people knowing who's hosting it. Another option for not leaving behind uh, data in the first place would be use boot media. If someone boots from a someone boots from a CD or a thumb drive, in theory, most all that data should be in memory. And if you shut the machine down fast enough, and no one can get to the RAM fast enough, the data should be gone. And there's a few examples of uh, boot media like uh, Nopix, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Unet Bootin. Uh, I don't have it listed here, but uh, well, actually, I do have it right here. Win Builder. If you want to make a Windows version that you can boot from a, a version of Windows, so you can Windows tools that will boot from a DVD or a thumb drive, you can create that. Now, in that one's case, I'm not sure what does and doesn't get written into the thumb drive, but regardless, it's a mobile, hideable operating system install. Oh, and I mentioned a little bit before about most of the stuff's all written in the memory, so in theory, it disappears in short order. There's something called the code boot attack. Your memory actually retains stuff in it for a little bit after power has been shut off to it. So if someone can get to it fast enough, they can actually dump the contents of the RAM. And people have been able to bypass a full hard drive encryption by basically grabbing the keys out of the RAM. And the way it's called the code boot attack is what you have to do is grab the laptop fast enough, grab the RAM out of it, keep it cold, throw it into the machine to suck the data off it, and you're done. Now, it's a neat attack. Uh, however, I'm not sure how practical it is, because imagine someone is uh, raiding someone else and the person was able to pull the power and keep the laptop away for <laughs> you know, 30 seconds, eh, they may not necessarily be able to recover that. If you freeze the RAM, like using compressed air turned upside down, that lengthens the period of time. You have yes, that's why it's called the code boot attack. But once again, the, guy's trying to, the guy unplugs the machine, turns it off, and keeps it away from you for 30 seconds. All right, selective file removal and encryption. Uh, the previous topic, I think that has some merit as far as uh, anti-forensics. Selective file removal is kind of pointless. It's for those who don't want to go all the way, those who don't want to wipe their entire drive, but just say, this is one particular file, I want it gone. Well, there's various tools for doing this. There's ones like Clean After Me, which uh, deletes certain common things in uh, Windows. For instance, it'll go through and delete the history of your USB devices you plugged in. Uh, web history and multiple browsers. Also, I'd like things like that, and you can choose an option to say zero out the file and override it so that even if someone goes looking for the file, as long as they're looking at those exact same sectors, all they should see is like zeros. Cleaner is a similar tool for doing much that. And there's many, many more for selected file wiping. There's also a tool called sdelete. Uh, now, sdelete's kind of interesting. Uh, it's from uh, Sys Internals. And you can point it at a particular file, and it's kind of like um, the Linux, well, it's kind of like the Windows version of the Linux tool Shred. Point it at a file, you can override it with other data and destroy it. However, the sdelete is kind of annoying from the standpoint of when you run it, there's a licensing agreement, and it automatically puts a value in the registry, so you know if someone's ran sdelete, unless of course they've gone back and automatically deleted that, or gone back in and deleted that registry entry. But that that's sad, but they'd probably be using a different tool. Uh, DD, which, oh great, I, people sometimes refer to it as Disk Destroyer. I'm trying to remember the, what the acronym actually stands for. DD allows you to write byte for byte, you know, copies of things and write bytes to drives and so forth. Uh, that's sometimes used for wiping a drive. For instance, um, I give an example here on this top line of wiping out 
a file called notes.docx using DD. There's also tools like Eraser, and as I mentioned before, there's a Unix tool called Shred for doing much of these same kind of things. There's also a way of wiping out all that Slack space I mentioned before in the residual Slack. Uh, there's a tool that comes with uh, Windows since, I think, Windows 2000 called Cypher. And uh, essentially what it can do is it fills up all the drive space with um, something called random data so that if someone tries to do a data call later on, they won't be able to find those file headers that we cover. <coughs> or you may not find any good file headers. So there's certain uh, file headers that look like random garbage, so you may still recover something, but hopefully it'll be random garbage in that case. But Cypher is a tool for basically wiping out slack space on a machine in Windows. Also, there's uh, selective file encrypting, like e EFS. Uh, that's come in with Windows since uh, Windows 2000. However, it's only <laughs> so much use, and it's best to use syskey as a password on boot, because I think there's some ways around it if you don't. Uh, also, my thing there's some ways, problems with the way EFS was um, implemented as far as how it does block Cypher mode which that gets way more deep into cryptography than I think I need to go to in this uh, talk. Uh, but it's not supposedly as secure. Um, TrueCrypt, on the other hand, you can do full hard drive encryption or selective hard drive encryption. And it's supposed to use some of the best uh, standard uh, encryption protocols out there for doing these kind of things. One of the things about encryption, you don't want to roll your own. You want to go with the standard libraries that have been tested. And there's all sorts of ways of screwing up uh, how you do encryption, which we're going to talk about here in a bit. There's also tools like uh, free OTFE, off the record. Um, but there are some tools that do really silly things. Like I found one that it will encrypt a volume on your thumb drive, but when you unencrypt something, it automatically takes that file, makes a temp copy on the thumb drive to actually open. But when you close whatever you, what you opened, it may delete the file, but it didn't wipe the file. So you can still recover it with a data card. So not all tools get this right. Uh, there are several reasons why I'm saying selective file wiping is not a good idea. First of all, Windows jams data in all sorts of places. There's also places where temp files get located. Just because you wipe the Word doc doesn't mean the temp file did, got wiped. Also, there's something called sh volume shadow copy, which can be constantly backing things up every time a sector, is that sector lever? Every time it changes, it can be backing it up someplace else. Uh, there's also things like uh, system defrag. So I showed you that disk before. Let's say that, I wish I had a round object around here. You have a big round object? Okay. Let's say you have a disk. And, ah, we've got markers. Look at the clock. I don't have anything. Hmm. No markers. All right, I'm just going to explain it the best I can. Let's say you have a disk, and the file was originally in this section. Will you defrag it? The way defrag works is it tries to put all the files <coughs> continuous. That way, when it's reading it off a disk, it's like reading an old record. I don't know, I'm going to get this reference. You have to, if you wanted to listen to the same song, but part of the song was here, part of the song was here, part of the song was here, and you had to move the needle every single time, that'd be freaking annoying and slow. So the idea behind defragging is it puts all the song or all the file in one continuous space. Well, the problem with this from a forensic standpoint, or any forensic standpoint, is the file was here, it got defragged, and now it's all over here. You'd wipe the file selectively, so you wipe out this part, but the remnants are still there. And you can go back and get that file. Um, there's also USB device logs, because someone deleted something off, of, uh, off a uh, drive, but you know someone used that thumb drive in that particular machine, that can give you some ideas. Also, there's hibernation files where all your memory gets thrown out to uh, the hard drive. So you may have deleted it, but it may have been up in memory at one time, remnants up in memory, and now those remnants are now in your hibernation file. And you can data carve away on those hibernation files. Oh, defrag issues, this is the picture I had. Here's an example, I should have used this before. Unfortunately, since I changed the color scheme, it looks really weird. And this is what I was trying to get over is, you may have moved the file from one place to another, but since the leftovers are still in its original location, those can be data carved. You can also pull up a device log of uh, what USB devices have been in a machine. And this can tell you where someone's been, because generally these USB devices, if the Thumb drives, at least, will have serial numbers. Uh, and you can use USD B view, USB D view for that, which is just a really nifty tool for diagnosing USB problems. And also, these various registry entries you can go check out to see what's been plugged into your machine. And there are similar things for Linux, and I'm trying to remember. Um, I think UDEV makes some kind of log, uh, but I don't remember exactly where it stores it. 
Hi, page file. Used for swapping out memory. Let's, let's say uh, there's some memory that's be better allocated to something else, or you're running out of memory and it needs to have extra RAM to run some applications. Stuff will get swapped out to the hard drive in page file.sys, or in the case of Unix-like operating system, swap space. Well, let's say you had a program up and running and you had a uh, word up and running opening the doc. Well, that doc could be up in memory, and now all of a sudden it got reallocated and said, ah, we don't need this part anymore, we're going to put it on the page file. It may exist in the page file for a while. So, again, selective file wiping isn't necessarily going to get that. Uh, you can disable the page file, and um, I guess on some modern systems with enough RAM, you can do that. I'm not sure how practical a solution this is versus full hard drive encryption, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Oh, you can also wipe the page file on every uh, shutdown. This takes a little bit of time. You can go into your um, group policy editor to set that up, but then expect every time you shut down the machine, it's going to take a while as it wipes out that uh, page file. Also, if someone confiscates the machine really quick, then if they just power it off, that's not going to help either. Uh, hibernation file, kind of similar to page file in a way, but it's for when the machine hibernates, it goes into sleep. Well, hibernation is different sleep mode, but it will write that stuff out to the hard drive so it can restore its previous session. You can go into power settings and disable that. Uh, data carving, there's various good tools. If you ever actually want to see what data is left on a thumb drive, put a bunch of data like Word docs on a thumb drive sometime, then delete them all out doing the proper format. And by proper format, I don't mean quick format, I mean full format. Uh, you go out there and you can see uh, various files on there. There's a tool called uh, PhotoRec. Um, particularly this one is actually, yeah, PhotoRec. You can sit there and you'll pull out JPEGs, bitmaps, uh, doc files, Excel files, and so forth off a drive after you've already deleted stuff off of it. If you want to be sure it's really gone, well actually uh, in modern versions of Windows, if you choose format but don't choose quick format, its format on thumb drives at least is pretty secure because it zeroes out that space. And we'll go cover a little bit about how many times you need to wipe a drive here in a bit, but one wipe is enough. Unless you eat Taco Bell. <laughs> okay. Thank you, I'll take the pity laughs. All right, Disk Digger is another tool. Unfortunately, it's gone commercial, but it's a lot easier to use. And you can find the old version before it went commercial. Uh, photo Rec, you can get from that URL. And there's other data carving tools that are like Scalper and so forth that are a little bit more harder to use, but might have more options for you. You want to play around with this. Also, if you're curious about an application where it's writing, I mentioned somehow that a lot of these applications write temp files, or you delete the file you think the data's in, and maybe a temp file someplace else the data is also in. If you want to look at an application for where it's storing stuff, like let's say I want to look at a browser and see what it's actually doing when it's in private browsing mode, I use Process Monitor and actually track what places on the network it's talking to, what spots in the registry it's editing, and where on the drive it's writing stuff to. So you can look at Process Monitor and find all this information to figure out what an application is actually doing as far as writing data to the drive. And, well, network and general information like that. Registrum app is something similar for just looking at what registry entries and changes something's making. Like, oh, there was some application, I want to say I didn't know what setting it was changing to do what it wanted to do. So I put Registrum app on it and it showed me what registry editor it was doing. Well, let's say you know some application is saving a password and you're pretty sure it's in the registry. You can use one of these tools and see where all it writes to and go, okay, I'm going to check out this file and this registry entry and this file and then pluck those passwords out. Or at least find out what it may store. It may store them in an encrypted or obfuscated format, but it gets you that one step closer. And uh, Process Activity View is another tool that's of similar nature. Uh, Politrix, these are things that aren't necessarily all that practical, they're kind of neat concepts and I think you hear people recommend on forums and so forth but aren't really practical. Uh, so if you watch the, the long form of this uh, talk where I just do the uh, hands-on demos, I don't know, I think it's like three hours, you can actually see me using some of these tools. Let's talk about Politrix, things people uh, talk about doing but probably aren't all that directly useful. Uh, some of these may actually be useful against what people might refer to as a tool or solution kitties. My saying, not all forensic examiners really necessarily know what they're doing. I'm not insulting anybody in this room. I'm saying, but as those people who are professional forensic examiners, you've met someone who's not really qualified to be doing what they're, what they're doing. I'm pretty sure. And they might just know how to use a tool at the very base level, or click next, 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 but that's the limit of their knowledge. The uh, forensic examiner in the Julia Merrill case may have been someone like this. Um, so these kind of uh, techniques may be effective against them, but for against uh, someone who knows what they're doing, not so much. 
Time stopping is an interesting technique. This is uh, part of the Metasploit framework. You can actually stop the times of uh, when a file was created, when it was last edited, and when it was last accessed using time stop. So you can actually set it to be a different date than what it actually was. Since you can do this though, I'd look at all these timestamps as, you know, somewhat questionable to begin with. Also, depending on what the timestamp is, I mean, there's a certain type of contraband someone might have on a drive. It doesn't matter when it was put there, unless, I guess it was before they owned the machine. Uh, it's probably going to be bad for them. Um, also, at one time, there was actually a setting you could make that would crash uh, in case. I believe it was this particular time stop command. Well, no, sorry, not this one. I think it may happen on the next slide. Oh, you can set an arbitrary time recursively using the for command in uh, Windows. And uh, time stop basically just has all these different options for setting a time on a file. And uh, I wish I found it in here. Oh yeah, the B option, that's the one that sets, uh, ink, sets its uh, a value on these time stomp stamps that will actually crash like older versions of Incase. Uh, alternative data streams is another interesting thing. Alternative data streams are put there as like file forks to store metadata. So let's say you had an NTFS volume, but you were going mounted on a, a remotely across the network on a Macintosh. Well, those various things the Macintosh wants to know about the file that's not necessarily in the file and you could store them in the alternative data streams. Well, you can also store other things. For instance, right here I'm hiding a file called myporn.jpg inside of Disney JG, JGP in a hidden file stream called hide. And then I can open it up later on using MS Paint using that command. And basically I'm specifying that hidden file share using the colon. Sorry, the... Uh, now, uh, let's see. Now you can see other kinds of alternative data streams are used. Have you ever opened up a file and it said this file was downloaded from the internet? And you know, are you sure you want to run it? The reason it knows that is your web browser automatically puts a hidden data, uh, alternative data stream behind it that says it was downloaded from the internet. And if you use one of these tools I'm going to mention here shortly, you can actually see that alternative data stream. And I have a whole guide out there on my website about how to use alternative data streams to hide stuff. The thing is, this isn't going to hide something from a file card. It's still on the drive. So it's kind of a neat trick, but it's not going to totally hide something from someone who knows what they're looking for. And there's various tools for finding alternative data streams. There's also shadow copy, which I mentioned a little bit before. Uh, shadow copy is kind of there so that you could um, back up something even while it's open. And it's kind of in the background on certain files. It's <laughs> keeping a copy of uh, sections as it's being changed. And those people have actually done work like, um, all right, there's a salmon system file that you can grab off a running box to be able to crack a password. It's a Windows box. Well, normally these files are locked. However, there's people who have found uh, ways of actually using volume shadow copy to grab those files, even though they're locked out of the volume shadow copy, and still be able to crack passwords. Uh, there's a tool from, uh, is it Mark Baggett and, I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name. Yeah, Mark Baggett and Tim Tomes, who uh, spoke at this last year's HackerCon. They had a tool called a, uh, VSS own, volume shadow copy own, that allows you to do tons of options as far as running things from volume shadow copy, I think recovering things from volume shadow copy, and so on and so forth. Though, I'm not sure how practical it is for hiding stuff there, because I'm not sure how long the file's going to stick around. Uh, if you go out to Windows and right click on the file and see restore previous version, it's actually pulling out a volume shadow copy. But I'm not always up on how long that stuff stays in the volume shadow copy. It's really a subject matter I need to do more research on. Oh, steganography. Steganography is essentially hiding stuff in other stuff so people can't find your stuff. And there's a lot of common ways of going about doing that. Part of the idea is, let's say uh, somebody finds a big blob of uh, encrypted data called mountme.tru, like TrueCrypt or TC. Someone might go, well, I'm pretty sure that's a TrueCrypt volume. Uh, I know someone's actually hiding something there, so I'm going to have to ask them more about it. However, if they just see a bunch of JPEGs or movie files someplace that look like movie files, they may not ask about them. That'd be steganography, hiding something inside of something else. And there's different ways this can be done. There's like tacked on steganography, where you add something onto something else. For instance, this particular command uses copy and copies JPEG, image.jpg, and putty.zip into one file called test.jpg. Now here's the thing about zips and JPEGs. 
JPEGs is that front part of the file that matters as far as the description of here's the file you're about to get. For zip files, the important part is the last part. So you can actually tack them together and depending on what you try to open them up in, it'll be both a valid JPEG and will open up in an image viewer and be a valid zip file which you can open up in a zip archive tool. But not all uh, JPEG viewers will accept this, but some will. Uh, there's also insertion. This gets a little more complicated. Um, let's see. You can take a docx file, like any modern um, Microsoft OS, I'm sorry, any Microsoft Office, that's actually, if you look at a docx or an xlsx and so forth, that's actually a zip file. Right click and rename it sometime, .zip, and you can open it up in the zip tool and you can actually jam stuff in there. You have to modify content underscore types that XML inside that zip file, make it not show up as an error when you open it up next. And if you save it out, it may very well disappear. But because it's a zip file, you can hide stuff in docx files and so forth. So yeah, give that a shot sometime. Actually, you know what? Eh, maybe we should actually do it. Just go Come on, fall over. Let's see. I think I have. Oh, Network King of the Hill, we're just playing this game. I have this docx file on my desktop. What happens if, uh, well, this machine is fairly new. So let's, uh, tools, folder options, view, I hate that one. I don't want to see, no, I don't see it in the drive necessarily. Uh, I want to see that. Uh, fine, okay. Now I can see my file extensions again. All right, right click, rename. Oh crap, I may be wrong because that's not a docx, that's a doc. That probably won't work. I can make it work though. <laughs> save as, <laughs> enable saving, and I want to go with newer Word formats that have been used for a while now. All right. Now I have an actual docx up here. If I rename that, dot .zip, It's a zip file. I can jam stuff in there. I have to modify some other files, but now I have a place I can hide stuff. And I have some tools out there for automatic making this process on my website. Oh, there's also additive steganography. Now this is the classic example, and there's tools out there for finding this, but um, can you tell if there's a difference between those two images if you just look at the far left? Well, there actually is a difference, because if you look at the values for each one of those uh, bits, for each one of those pixels, it's slightly different. Notice that that red is not a full red, it's a 254 here and 255 up here. People can just change a little bit of the color, because that one red versus the other red is hard to tell, but there's still a one bit difference. So you can actually hide bits on each pixel, and you can actually hide more than that, depending on how you code your algorithm. And there's more complex algorithms for hiding stuff in other images. But the basic idea is you do modifications to the image that aren't perceivable to the human eye, like you know, 255 red versus 254 red. But it's perceivable to a computer program which can pluck that stuff back out. And I have another tool out there that actually does this kind of additive steganography. Though, quite frankly, it's the supposed stuff out there for analyzing and finding this now. But it's still fun to play around with. Oh, by the way, this file, uh, I think what I encoded in it was I should be able to hold 37 bytes encoded. Everything in quotes is what's actually inside that, even though it looks like the exact same image. Oh, lemon white. Now this one's probably not a good idea from the standpoint it's going to piss off the forensic examiner. Uh, people talk about wiping a drive with all ones, all zeros, all random, with seven, you know, 37 wipes of varying things. But why do that? Why not wipe with arbitrary data? Why not find an image you find interesting and share it with everybody else who wants to look at your drive? So find an image you like or don't like or you think is going to disturb someone else. Grab it and you can essentially use either DD or in uh, Windows you can use this little batch file I wrote and wipe out a drive and use this image laid over and over and over again down the entire drive. Uh, let's say mylittlepony.jpg if you like my My Little Pony. I don't care. So then when someone goes around and does a data carve on it, all they find is six billion My Little Pony <laughs> images. The same one, over and over again. Though, like I said, pissing off the, uh, uh, someone who's examining might make them look harder for data, so. I'm not saying do this for the law, against law enforcement or anything, I'm just saying these are ideas that people could do 
And if you want to hide stuff from your Snoopy roommate, you know, it's fine to do. You can also password protect and, and encrypt steganography, hidden data as well. That's yes. Resources, yeah. Resources. You, for the various tools out there will actually not only write the data into the uh, image, but it will also encrypt it for you. Or you can encrypt it before you put an image and then just put it in the image. But yeah, you don't have to just choose steganography or encryption. You can do both. Also, the concept of this is one of those bad ideas, booby trap devices, laying stuff around that looks like a thumb drive but isn't. Um, how many of you have ever, as a physics examiner, used those little um, oh, mouse movers or wigglers so that something doesn't, a system doesn't go to sleep? It's like you plug it in, it acts like a mouse, and it constantly moves. It's like a pixel or pixel, so it doesn't go to sleep. Well, you can do that with something called a Tensi. It can act as a USB key keyboard or a USB mouse, but you can also make one look like a thumb drive. So imagine if you're on this payload, you make something that looks like a thumb drive, they're going to examine it, they plug it in, and all of a sudden it starts running commands on the system. Drops out to a command prompt, starts adding accounts, starts wiping, deleting files, and whatnot. And uh, they're actually pretty easy to program. Uh, you should program in a development environment called Arduino, or actually you can do it in raw C also. But uh, the Arduino version is much easier to use, in my opinion. And uh, you can make these simple, scriptable plugins that you plug it in, it acts as a keyboard and mouse and starts doing stuff on the computer whenever someone inserts it. Those will also bypass any USB. Yeah, U-free protection. U-free protection doesn't apply since it's not a, it's not a U-free thumb drive. It's actually acting as a keyboard as opposed to acting as something on a virtual CD-ROM that it tries to load off of. So there are all ways of blocking that. I got a whole other talk on USB vulnerabilities and USB uh, tricks. It can be blocked also, though it's a pain and most people don't. Uh, also, another interesting thing that's not going to save you on a lot of systems, on versions of Windows I've played with, if you have two partitions on a thumb drive, Windows will only see one, Linux will see both. They may have changed that in Windows 7, I don't think I've tested that in a while. Also, there's the subject of cloud computing. A lot of people go, well, you know, if I don't have it on my drive, it's something that's out there on the internet, I might be safer. Well, yeah, I guess not going to find it. may not necessarily find the drive on your machine, though it might be in some kind of cache. But my understanding as far as uh, cloud security, it's probably easier from a Fourth Amendment uh, protection standpoint for the law to get information out of the cloud than it is out of your home PC. Though, once again, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't guarantee that. But I'd imagine it would be easier to subpoena Google for my information than it would be to get the required warrants to come into my house and grab my machine. All right, attacking the forensic software. I've been messing around with some of these other ideas. Um, I have this article out there on uh, cross-site scripting for um, web forms and uh, more than just web forms, like uh, trying to put a cross-site scripting attack inside a barcode. So when someone scans it, if it goes into the database system uh, it, and they have a web display at some point in time, that cross-site scripting attack may actually play there. Same thing for SQL injection. Uh, SQL injection is basically where you modify the SQL statement by inserting your own parts. They don't do the proper kind of um, filtering or if they don't do um, input validation. Well, input validation or um, queries that are stamped. Um, damn it, it's not coming to my head. Tokenized queries. Yeah. I imagine a lot of people are now, you know, somewhat uh, somewhat knowledgeable about uh, filtering stuff coming into a web application. But how many people think about barcode that gets scanned into a terminal, a point of sale place, but it's still going into a database in the back end. Well, I wonder if this place was doing this same kind of cross-site scripting in the data that someone might try to recover from a drive. Uh, there's also a whole talk out there on DEF CON 15, from DEF CON 15 on breaking forensic software. Oh, this is a zip file you can download off the net that is a valid zip file. It's not too big at all, but when you unzip it, the format is such that it tries to create a file or a set of files that's 4.5 petabytes. <laughs> Most of you probably don't have that much hard drive space. Uh, it's also known as a zip bomb. And two comments on this attack. Once again, if an attack examiner sees the data is attacking him, they will know something up, is up, and do you really want to piss off the uh, defensive examiner? All right, <laughs> thermite, this has been talked a lot about. Probably not that practical. Um, first of all, just know destruction of evidence charges is pretty likely. Does the fire hazard issue? Just using fill drive hard drive encryption is a lot easier. And uh, while we're on that topic, I have a video out there that I call Better Than Gutman Wipe, and uh, you can go out there and uh, 
think that's I think that's the right video. You see us them blowing the hell out of hard drives with an AK-47, a shotgun, and various other uh, firearms. <laughs> that's generally pretty effective. I mean, yeah, you can still get the bites off, but you have to be someone that someone really wants to take a drive that's been shattered and recover that. Okay, nuke it from orbit is the only way to be sure. Oh, that thermite thing, I should uh, add some extra that. There's been some work on that thermite to actually make it practical. There was a guy, um, or oh, some people from the, the Shmoo group um, tried to do something and they didn't have a whole lot of success. Then someone went to Shmoo Khan and said, yeah, I saw Charles talk. Here's how you do it. And they had like a 1U um, rack mount the server and they wanted to find a way of taking like 1U up top, 1U at the bottom, yeah. not cause a fire hazard, not cause a smoke hazard, but still basically incinerate the drive in between. And this guy figured out how to do it for not too expensive. I think, didn't he use like drywall as his insulation material and a fan and he was able to actually make a, you know, a viable thermite destruction utility. I'd still say the destruction of evidence stuff would still apply, but anyway. Nuke it from orbit, that's the only way to be sure. Uh, these are more reliable techniques. First of all, just wiping the entire drive out using DD. Uh, D-band is a similar tool, you can do the same thing. Uh, D-band you can boot from a thumb drive or a USB and use it. There's also the uh, hard drive wipe tool. Uh, there is one problem with these. They don't do a completely secure erase. There's actually something in the um, IDE, or sorry, the ATA specs called, I believe it's called Secure Erase, where DD and D-Band, they don't know about, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name, is P-List. Essentially your drive will set aside parts of the drive as they go bad and go, okay, we're not going to use you anymore. Well, those parts don't get wiped by D-Band because D-Band doesn't think the stuff that it can write to. It's not even told about it on the drive. However, those parts that can no longer be written to may still have old data. And I hope that I have a slide on that here in the section. Sector. In a second, sorry. Oh, as far as um, the whole debate about how many wipes to do on a modern drive, one wipe is enough, and there's been plenty of study into this. So let's say um, you try, if people did this study, um, there was like a 92% chance of recovering the correct previous bit on a brand new pristine drive if it's been wiped once, and a 56% chance on a used drive. Let's go with that 92% chance. That sounds pretty good for recovering one bit, right? Well, let's multiply that out. The chances of getting one whole byte is actually only 51%. The chances of getting one full kilobyte, because the uh, statistics on that, is that particular value, which I don't even know how to pronounce that. So generally speaking, one wipe is enough. The problem with some of these tools, though, like I said, is they don't get the bad block list. Uh, there's something called Enhanced Secure Erase. And there's tools out there for doing it, like HDPRAM and uh, MHDD. Uh, like I said, the soot blocks as your drive is being used, it might mark as bad and says, okay, the data's there, I'm going to reallocate what I used to call that address space, this is my understanding how it works, and put it here instead, and I'll stop using that. Well, that part doesn't get reported to an operating system necessarily, or even, I don't know if it gets reported to the BIOS, I think it's all internal on the drive itself. So things like D-Band won't know to wipe that. How these other tools will send a signal using the ATA specs to say, even those bad block lists, wipe them. The problem I've had with that is on the machines I've tried it on, I think the BIOS locks out that option because if people could do that really easily, then people could <laughs> you can have malware really destroy a drive fast. It's also a lot faster way to wipe a drive if your machine supports it. Uh, also, there's various I options for uh, full system drive encryption. Uh, there's BitLocker. Those people out there using a, how they introduced that in Vista, did they not? Yeah. Uh, that adds extra options on Windows 7 do full hard drive encryption. Um, I don't know how much I trust it. Uh, there's other options. It's also TrueCrypt on Windows. You can basically encrypt the entire hard drive. Uh, you could be including the operating system. And with TrueCrypt, you can also create a, a false bottom sort of thing where you have a separate operating system. TrueCrypt has this ability to know its positive reliability. Depending on what password you use, it shows different contents. Now, on the outer volume, if you write too much data, it'll destroy the inner volume. But with TrueCrypt, you can actually have two operating systems on a drive, but have the entire drive encrypted, and depending on what pos password you give someone, it gives them a different operating system to boot into. Also, might want to look at hard drive-based encryption, just because it's probably going to be a lot faster. Okay, another option I'm looking into, and I don't know how much stuff rounds up in the uh, page file from this, I haven't actually done tests, 
uh, is running a VM from a TrueCrypt volume because it actually does write out memory to whatever directory you have the uh, virtual machine in. Uh, but you can make various settings in the VMX file to tell not to use memory. So I'm wondering if you uh, mount, if you have a virtual machine and it's in an encrypted volume, how much data would actually leak out of it? Very That's little, but it's slow. When you cut off the memory access and everything like that, through <coughs> what you find out there, it's extremely slow. So okay. You lose a lot of your performance, but you still have a very secure uh, I haven't actually tested myself, just kind of idea I thought about doing. And seeing as that's two years since I made that slide, it's, I haven't done it yet, that's probably not so good. Um, oh, other tools to look into, Def Linux is a, a Linux distribution for um, doing forensics work. FTK Imager you can also get. WinHex is, I think I have some of my screenshots, if you want to look at the actual bytes that are on a disk, I uh, recommend using WinHex. Um, now how do you know if someone's been has ran uh, anti-forensic software on the computer. Well, there's no way to really necessarily know. You can look for file names, as I mentioned before. Also, in the case of the S-Delete, it actually writes stuff into the registry whenever you accepted the end-user license agreement. Uh, I need to work on some tools to actually detect this sort of thing. Uh, also, also uh, newer versions of Windows, if I remember right, Windows XP, if you chose even a full format, it didn't zero out uh, like a thumb drive. However, in Vista and Nua, it does. And then those solid state drives, there's its own kind of weird allocation. Um, check out this guy named Scott Moulton, who's done a whole talk on forensics and uh, uh, solid state drives that you may want to check out. Apparently, there's some complications there as well. Let's see. Oh. As far as hashing is concerned, all it takes is like one bit change to totally change what the file is. So if someone's just looking for a certain file by its hash, if in the case of like a JPEG, all they have to do is change one pixel and it's not no longer have the same hash. Also, if someone if you're looking for an EXE by its hash, if someone compiles some source with a slightly different compiler, it's not gonna have the same hash. Then there's various packers out there for taking an EXE and mutilating it to where, where it's smaller, but also it's not gonna have the same hash. And then those tools like Shikata Ganai, which is, um, is part of Metasploit, which you can uh, take a payload and it sort of encrypts it in a way and does it randomly. And uh, Shikata Ganai, I believe, is like a Japanese term that means something along the lines of nothing can be done about it. And this is going to give it a different hash. And also, uh, once Shikata Ganai is used, a lot of uh, any malware stuff just ain't going to see it. Uh, all right. Thanks to Scott Moulton for a lot of the questions I was asking him while I was uh, preparing this talk. Uh, Tyler Tripp Pritchard for answering some legal questions for me, and the folk at, at the uh, ISD and Paul.com podcast because I emailed them for some suggestions a while back. A quick announcement, DerbyCon's coming up September 27th through the 30th. If anyone wants stickers, I got them around here someplace. And a bunch of other cons I recommend going to, but since I had that exact same slide in my next talk, no sense in covering it. Finally, are there any questions? Meeting a lot. 42, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> or uh, to crush your enemies and see them driven before you handle limitations of the women. <laughs> All right, well, that's what's best in life, not the meaning of life, Thank which is you. kind of similar related. If you don't have any questions, the digital forensics folks should probably have to get away from the continuation for the digital forensics um, track. And then Adrian will speak again. Let's take a 10 minute break. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian.